I uh, have the honor and I'm pleased to introduce our speaker this morning, uh, Professor Tony Archimedes. Tony received his PhD from uh, Princeton University almost 40 years ago. And since his student days, he's been interested in information theory and he's taken a particular interest in networks. He's received many awards for his work. I'd like to mention just a couple of things he's uh, contributed to of special significance. With his first PhD student, Jeff Weasel there, and Dennis Baker at Naval Research Laboratory, he developed algorithms, a link cluster algorithm and routing algorithms for mobile ad hoc networks in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. This has contributed a lot to the understanding of how uh, distributed algorithms for ad hoc networks work. In the 1990s, with the student uh, Leandros Tassiulis, he developed a framework for proving throughput optimality of scheduling algorithms, routing algorithms for, for networks. That played a, uh, a big role in also highlighting the gains you can get from cross-layer uh, protocols and uh, crossing traditional boundaries in, in networks with, in some reverse way. And he's also been a proponent of the cross-layer uh, considerations of wireless. He's been a mentor for many students who are prominent researchers in their own right, He's also been a mentor for many people that aren't his students through his, uh, his uh, involvement in the Information Theory Society. As you know, he's been the historian of the society. He's also a co-founder of the YOPT conference series, uh, enthusiastic supporter of the Infocom uh, conference on networking. And uh, Tony's also an opera singer. He has a natural flair for the dramatic. This shows up in his written work and, and on his oral presentations maybe especially in his titles. So, uh, without further delay, I'd like to uh, have you uh, join me in welcoming Tony to give his presentation this morning on the audacity for a book. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, you know, as Bruce said, I've been around for some time and I remember coming to the ICITS in the early days and uh, watching the plenary uh, sessions. And at that time you had the icons of the society loom larger than life. And then over the years I started seeing my close friends being the plenary speakers, I, some of whom I respected more than others and so on and I thought it wasn't such a big deal. And now here I am uh, giving the plenary talk. So I thought that confirms the model of three phases in life. The first phase, you believe in Santa Claus. <laughs> the second phase, you don't believe in Santa Claus. <laughs> and the third phase, you become Santa Claus. <laughs> So here we are going to talk about rates, and uh, in this uh, symposium already I heard terms like channel capacity, information theoretic capacity, network capacity, transport capacity, transmission capacity, rates, throughputs, stability regions, so what, what, what's happening, what, what are the rates? And, and is there a single measure of rates? Are there really multiple ones, especially if one going to networks? So this is what the talk is about, and uh, the title will be justified a little later in the talk, uh, where if you look at the traditional concepts of throughput, uh, there is something that comes out that you might expect to see also in information theoretic capacities. So you may have seen the subtitle I talk a trilogy of rates, so there will be at least three among the various terms I mentioned, uh, which I will consider. Actually, as it will turn out, these three lead to a fourth one, so maybe it's a tetralogy. But of course, as you might expect, this talk will also try to make an assessment on the status of consummation famous consummation of physical layer information theory and upper layers networking. 
So, also there will be opera in the talk, as Bruce mentioned. And so you notice, uh, of course, in the model of uh, consummation, let's us agree that the information theory will be the female and the networking will be the male. So here is a very unsuccessful womanizer, Falstaff. You see he has three. By the way, I should thank Bei Yurong, my student, for helping me with the slides. And also, we will, we're trying a new method of pointing here. As I point somewhere, you see it's way over there too. That's Bei Yu is doing. So, <laughs> Falstaff was an unsuccessful womanizer, and he has, you see, something is missing. There's three rates, there's a fourth rate that's missing. But we can also look at a successful womanizer, a very successful womanizer. Giovanni, again the same thing, three. There's this fourth that's missing, so let's discover the fourth rate. So we'll start very modestly. Consider a point of point link, and in dotted line you see also an input, which is something you don't normally see in information theoretic models. So there is a source, there is a channel, there is a destination, and there is traffic coming in. In the beginning it won't be coming, it will be coming later. So, Three rates, capacity, throughput, stable throughput. Let's define them. Capacity is what we all know. It can be measured in bits per second or in bits per channel, used for discrete models. The key thing is that we know these notions mostly for backlogged sources, so there is always traffic to be transmitted. And then we have a stable throughput that perhaps not everybody is as familiar with, which definitely requires that there is burst the arrival stream coming in to the source and lining up for transmission. Now, in order to make the apples and apples comparisons, we will be looking at bits per second for everything. So there is the packet in networking people consider the units of transmission that we call the packets and everything in the upper layer deals with packets and they forget how many bits, what kind of bits are inside the packet. So, a packet will have n bits and will last a period of time. One way to connect networking considerations with physical layer is a very convenient, very reasonable, accurate model, the packet erasure channel model, where we say the packet gets transmitted, but it doesn't always get through, so we have a probability of success in every attempt. So, the throughput would then be defined as n bits, but it's not all the bits that are useful bits. There will be overhead bits. At a minimum, for a point-to-point -point transmission where there is no need for control of any sort, there will be the need for error correction. So, the actual useful payload will be something less than n. And so, divided by the time tau that it takes for the packet time to probability of success, that would be the throughput bits per second. Now if we look at the more classical view from the physical layer, we know that we transmit at some rate r, which of course cannot exceed the capacity of that channel. And the traditional framework there is that we have k information bits, we have a code word of length n, which is longer, that let's think of, of it as the packet. So the packet will be a code word. And then Again, assuming that there is no more overhead in the packet than the uh, portion of the code word that attempts to do a correction, then again we come up with the rate with the rate being equal to well the number of useful bits that go through, but they don't go all the time if we don't have the coding error and over that period of time. So it's the same formula. So very good, we're happy, rate equals throughput and maximum throughput and maximum rate approach capacity as so that establishes that throughput and uh, capacity are the same thing for the point-to-point -point transmission. What about S? Now, S is what we call the stable throughput. Uh, first of all, stability. What does it mean? There are many definitions, and some are stronger than others about what we require, the behavior. So here now we have the and the arrival process in bold, packets do come in. And there is a channel here that serves, transmits with rate R. 
as close to zero as we can. And there is a fluctuating size in the cube here, L, so we want to require something about the size of L. We don't want it to be going to infinity too quickly. Sometimes we insist that it stays on average finite. Well, there is a convenient definition of uh, stability, which is not the strongest, but which is used a lot, particularly because we have strong criteria to establish uh, stability, namely the Lloyd's theorem that requires that if the probability that the Q size will uh, exceed a large number m goes to zero as that large number goes to infinity. So we're satisfied with that. For Markovian Q sizes, it means simply that you have an ergodic Markov chain in, for the Q size. So it's not exactly finite delay, but it's something close to controlling the so the powerful criterion is the law theorem that says so long as the arrival rate does not exceed the service rate, then we are stable. So what is the maximum value of the arrival rate that we can tolerate having this condition? So that will be the stable throughput, uh, rate throughput for the point-to-point -point case. But now, if we look at this object, we can ask the question, all right, whatever is the stable throughput rate, which would the stable throughput rate as, as the previous uh, plane shows, uh, it, it will, by Lloyd's theorem, so long as it's less than or equal to the rate of service here, it will be stable, so the maximum stable throughput uh, rate here is just R, same as T, all approaching C. But if we recognize the fact that there is information in the randomness of the arrivals, then it is possible that more information can be transmitted from one side to the other than C allows. That was demonstrated beautifully in the landmark paper, bits through cues, many of you are familiar with it, uh, some time ago, that showed that actually, by of course considering now that the possible messages are not the contents of the packets that get transmitted, but also the inter-arrival times uh, of all those packets, you can get a rate that's greater than the classical C. So let us call that C sub B. So that is the fourth type of rate. Now that has to do with the fact that there is timing information, right? So it's not backlog source. You see the importance of the back backlog source. You see that the backlog or lack thereof uh, is also important from another point of view that has nothing to do with information per se, but has to do more with how a server is shared between competing customers. So uh, earlier work, which for networking people, uh, this paper has not uh, past the statute of limitations, uh, even though it's uh, already uh, a long time uh, ago, it remains uh, uh, inspirational for uh, at least a lot of people who deal with these issues in the networking community. Now, uh, what was considered there was a very simple multiplexing scheme over a link with random sources that switch from sort of binary to busy and vice versa. And it was looked at in a different viewpoint by calculating how much is the uh, additional overhead that this causes and that inadvertently will have to be transmitted so you have to provide enough capability to transmit that implicit information and it could be huge. It could be, it, it need not be as modest as uh, it was shown in, in, in this case. So there is a new rate which is, let's call it, a capacity from point to point with bursty traffic. Now, we know that uh, it's difficult to compute this probability of error, decoding error, especially in relation to the forward length and the rate. There are bounds, most recent work that will be reported on Thursday, actually this symposium tightens these bounds and shows that for simple channel models you can get some good hold of that. Uh, however, the, in, in certain cases where the channel has a simple fault, 
where the noise is either Gaussian or a variation of a Gaussian process, or an alpha stable process, then we can shut the complexity of this whole problem into what is the value of the threshold. So that probability of error or probability of success is expressed in terms of the event that the signal to noise ratio exceeds the threshold. Now the value of that threshold is not easy to compute. Now I'm saying here recently and mindlessly embraced by the networking community. And what I mean by that is that for many years uh, networking people looked at the notion of a packet with a very simple collision channel model, especially in the wireless case. Either you succeed or you don't succeed. And if two users try to transmit at the same time, they will not succeed. Well, once they uh, recognize that there is a simple criterion in some cases where you can define the probability of success in a concrete way, without fully understanding uh, the communication theory that's underneath, uh, they have embraced it and they're using it uh, for in cases even where it clearly doesn't apply. Uh, so with uh, such a simple uh, channel model N, you can incorporate uh, the, the fading aspect, you can have this criterion and then everything gets shot into the value of the threshold. One note here about something that is being abused <coughs> in our community when we try to compute capacities, that gives a bet that probability of success of the packet. Many times we have a packet erasure model and we say Q sub bet for each link is some number six, and then we make asymptotic arguments about n. We let n starting to go to infinity and we keep QS fixed. That is not doesn't make sense. It's not an accurate thing. But of course, we do many inaccurate things, and it's not clear what the effect of keeping that assumption is. But especially in proving claims of capacity achievement in network holding cases, this has been done. And strictly speaking, it is not correct or meaningful. So let's move to multiple users from the point to point. Again, what happens to these three rates and perhaps that fourth rate? Now we deal with regions, it's not numbers anymore. And uh, of course, uh, most people are familiar with uh, and accept the notion that things must be convex. This region must be convex, but they need not be. We know that, especially in contention models like wireless multi access channels, these regions can be concave as well. So, is it true that these three are the same? So far, the easy answer, the early answer, is that we don't know a definitive answer for all cases. So, we know. Uh, certain cases where this is true, or it's not true, and so on, and we're still trying to determine that. There is also the sum rate, is the notion of not looking at the region, but just the sum of the components. And that's important because sometimes there's confusion about claims that are made. So, for the non wireless, so in this case, uh, we can think of any arbitrary system, complex network, or multi access channel, we'll have regions like that in multiple. Mentioned. So, networking, of course, first considered non wireless objects, and then the graph was a natural model, and early on, uh, the notion of the cut sets and the max flow mean cut theorem was a useful tool in determining throughputs. Of course, there, as the was saying yesterday, we deal with a graph with weights, that is, there's some number on each link, which means some working capacity, maybe the capacity of the link, maybe a working rate. So long as we have that, we can define cuts. And then, of course, if we have a set of sources, X, not a single one, necessarily, and a set of destinations, Y, on two sides of the cuts that we consider, then, of course, that's what uh, this says, that the, uh, the sum rate, the total rate going from not, not the region, but the sum rate going from one side to the other will just satisfy its inequality. And it's uh, interesting to note that uh, uh, this view of the uh, cut notion um, is for a single source and a single destination case, nothing else than a generalization of what a minor system is. Right? So you have diversity of paths. And Minimum of the combined capacity of the cuts in the is what uh, gives you the rate at which you can transmit. So that was used a lot. A, a small digression on network coding, which is related a lot, has made use of, of this uh, uh, concept a lot. Uh, uh, let me 
first thing, this was a, in, in not just my view, but the view of a lot of people in both the network and community. Perhaps it's not realized as much in the information period community what a major step towards consummation the invention of network calling was. And it was simply because the earth shaking observation was made that the package consists of bits and advantage was taken of that fact. So, the match forming gut plays a crucial role. That's the classic butterfly example of network coding. And uh, the miracle of network coding is that if you look at the classic case where we have a multicast of two destinations, if you look at just one destination, Y1, uh, the uh, link cut is if every link has nominal capacity of one packet per slot it will be getting two spot, in two packets per spot, and that's what the network coding achieves. Why it wouldn't be achieved without network coding? And the tradition has been to call it the complement of network coding, to call it routing, to say network coding beats routing. That's a very, uh, not, not the best way to describe because routing in network community means something which always takes place. You're going to decide to route, so what really is meant is Network coding versus story and forwarding. Story and forwarding and network philosophy has been believing in the sanctity of packets. We don't break them up. They are suitcases and we send suitcases back and forth. Once you break them up and mix their content, uh, then you do network coding. So it's as opposed to story and forwarding. So if we now forget about network coding and come back to the three different rates in a general network, we have a source X1, a source X2, a destination Y1, a destination Y2. It's not a matter anymore of just trying to identify mutual information between them as we do in a point-to-point -point, uh, case. We have tremendous constraints of the topology and the timing that routing and uh, flow choice, path choice implies. So yes, there is an abstract view that says all a network is, in this case, is just a conditional distribution. And maximize over topology, so we would have a characterization of a rate region for every possible geometry. So, where am I getting with that? That this is not just ambitious; it's really an impossible task. Uh, Shannon himself, in famous interviews to the Spectrum uh, in the, I guess, in the eighties, he, he was asked explicitly, "Can your theory be extended to?" objects like multi-access, which was very intensely being studied at the time. He, his answer was yes, but new ideas are needed beyond the classical ones. Maybe we're seeing some of these ideas already, and so progress is being made. But when he was asked for a general network, he gave an unequivocal, almost unequivocal, no, I don't think so. And one of the reasons was that in networks, of course, latency is an overriding concern rates, and that if you want to formulate questions of at what rate can we transmit under a delay constraint, then you have a fundamental problem in networks in that if you pose your delay constraint across the network or on the link, then it's just the network is not closed uh, for the same delay constraint uh, with a delay constraint on its links. If you say the delay constraint is two for every link, then for a tandem of two links has to be four. So already this concept would not be applicable. So what can we do there? Of course, we, we are not sure, but definitely a fundamental roadblock uh, occurs. So I put both a question mark and an exclamation mark there, but some people say forget it. We cannot, we have to invent new things. Others say, well, should we? Maybe we shouldn't. And, and we should persist, and find shortcuts or different ways. Things like Recently introduced, recently introduced concepts um, like uh, transmission capacity. I'm not going to be talking about transmission capacity much, but many of you know what it is, and there have been papers already in the symposium and in recent years. It's a different object. It's not totally accurate in, 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 under the lens of the strict lens of information theoretic orthodoxy, but it's a useful uh, tool to get you somewhere. So, um, I recognize it's a fundamental. Now, just a, again a small digression on wireless network coding. Network coding in, in graphs and so on was 
well understood, has been advanced a lot, and to some degree in wireless cases as well. Some contribution we did on that recently with my student Yali in uh, is that uh, we, can do it, we can extend the capacity at shipping property of network body in a wireless setting. If we're a little careful how we define cuts, so if a link becomes a hyperlink, what does that mean? That if you have, as we do in wireless, that when this node transmits, you get a whole bunch of other nodes that receive that transmission. And if we say that every individual link has a gain nominal capacity or throughput capability of one unit, then we shouldn't say that this cut has uh, capacity or value the sum of the, the ones who are going to the links, but just, just one put by the node. So we replace the link by hyperlink. But that's not enough. The most important observation was that you really have to connect your arguments about what you can achieve to the multi-access limitations that are imposed by your network. Now I'm saying here, take again the butterfly picture in a wireless setting. What does it mean? Links in a wireless setting. We don't have links. Every pair of nodes can be connected with a link for the proper power and proper rate. So what this means in order to get somewhere is that if nobody else transmits, a drone link means it's possible to transmit from one point to the other. So what is shown here is uh, sets of independent, independent sets of links, which means you can have simultaneous transmission, say, of X1 and of this one, or of X1, or that node, and then from that node, or symmetrically, or only that. If it's a simple model of all the action interference that simply says uh, two nodes that share, two links that share a node cannot be activated simultaneously. But under this um, simple scheduling time division, uh, scheduling of uh, independent sets of links, uh, you can have a concrete statement of the extension of the network holding capability along with the conversion of a link to hyperlink. But uh, just sweepingly saying that we replace links with hyperlinks and then the claims for network holding carry over is not as that exactly right. So, a lot can be done here to remove the suboptimality by considering more sophisticated and realistic models of interference and what's possible to be activated simultaneously. But, okay, these were parenthetical statements. Let's come back to the simplest model we have for a non-point-to-point -point case where we can say something concrete about the rates. So that's the collision chart, an object of intense interest in the decade of the 80s. And let me not uh, spend much time to remind you what it is. We have slotted time if you transmit by yourself Successful. If not, you are not successful. Nothing goes through. This is an idealized but useful for a while modeling of the interference limited channel. The important observation to make about the collision channel is that, as far as bit rate is concerned, it doesn't say anything. It allows the possibility that the bit capacity of the channel is infinite. If, if when you transmit a single packet, you are guaranteed success, and there is no constraint put on the number of bits you can have in the packet, that means that you can put as many as you want. And, and of course, uh, either you will say it has infinite capacity if it's a continuous time model, if you, of course, consider it as a discrete time, then you have, you have a problem there. Packets are in continuous time. If you want to apply discrete time models to packet-based objects, then you have to say every slot is Time, but then we don't usually use packets as symbols, although that has been done successfully in isolated cases. Uh, so it's better to think of continuous time and then uh, for the packets and then have inside each uh, time unit of the slot a discrete time model for the channel in mind. So we have channel uses bit by bit until the packet is exhausted. So to keep it simple and not have high rate contributions here, let's say every use of the channel, maximum you can transmit is one bit, and you have an unlimited number of bits in the, in the uh, packet. Uh, the interesting case, of course, for this type of model is to have random access potential for its use, because if you don't, then you organize very simply uh, the transmission rights. Every user gets his own spot, and, and there's nothing to, to say. So if 
there is a random match and that means every individual user attends transmission in a given slot of its pipe. If it has one, the probability P sub i. We do know a lot about this, this object. And here we depict the throughput region for a two user case, the stable throughput region and the capacity region, or for this case you can argue that's close to the CP uh, region. That is capacity with bursty traffic or without bursty traffic. So uh, this is very easy to see. Throughput means backloaded users, so they always have a packet to transmit. And the rules are you attempt transmission with probability P sub i. So what you can get is this point. If you transmit successfully, and this is measured here now in packets per slot, with probability P1 if you're user 1 and you must uh, require that the other user does not attempt transmission, otherwise you won't be successful. So this is the point. If you now say sources are not backlogged, then there is a chance that when you attempt transmission, the other user doesn't have any. You're not limited to that maximum possible transmission through rate. So you can do more. And this is the new element that allows for increase from throughput to stable throughput. The notion that the resource that's being shared, those sharing it are not always demanding the most they can get out of it. Because they're not there. For part, random part, unpredictable part of the time. So you can show that you get this extension of the stable throughput. The region can be for this object greater than the throughput region, the backlog case. Now, for this capacity now, measured in bits per second, it's a very interesting story because there have been different derivations. Uh, so, first, let me just say that there is some background work relating to this that utilized the stochastic dominance to obtain the characterization of the stable throughput region. It is a notorious and difficult problem to extend it to more than two users. Uh, attempts have been made and uh, various people have contributed uh, extensions, bounds to the stable throughput regions. Uh, but uh, still, for end users, we don't know what it looks like. So for the capacity, there have been two landmark papers, one by Mattis and Massey, and uh, one by Pui and Lee, around the same time in the mid-80s. And we calculated slightly different objects. Uh, I won't go into the details of what they calculated. In, in the case of Mathis and Mass, it was a, a synchronous system, zero error capacity, not a model with fixed P1 and P2 for the users, just use the packets as symbols essentially and construct cones that achieve this particular uh, region which cannot be exceeded, hence the capacity. Uh, we only used a slightly different approach. The, the, uh, started with using specific P1, P2, and then took the envelope over P1 and P2, and they obtained the characterization of the same curve. And what's interesting is that if we take the stable throughput region calculated without information theoretic tools, but just using theoretic tools, and take the envelope, the union of these regions over P1 and P2, we find exactly the same uh, curve as the capacity region. And so there must be a reason it cannot be the coincidence. And the best way to see why is by simplifying an argument that is essential to the proof that says that the, the, informa the information rate consists of the payload, what you are actually transmitting, the packets, and then there is the, inform the, the information rate that is generated by a user being idle or busy, and also by the identity of who is the user who is transmitting. So you get a packet, who is it? And transition from busy to idle also carries information. So if you were to write the total information rate, it would be the sum of three things. And notice that we don't characterize here explicitly these two. But for the payload, it's very simple. It's a perfect channel. So it's n bits. The time is a probability of success. And then if you divide by n to normalize an information rate per channel use for the information theory argument, you find that, of course, as n then goes to infinity, n q stays the same, which I cautioned against early in the talk and said that is not strictly speaking correct, it's not a meaningful model, but if you do that, uh, then you find that essentially as n goes to infinity, the information rate 
becomes the same indistinguishable thing with the probability of success. And these two regions are essentially probabilities of success. And that's why the two regions coincide. As I was saying, little is known uh, for more than two users. And so, um, on this issue, there has been debate about the, whether these three quantities are equal or not. Some people take it for granted they have to be equal. They're the same thing. They cannot be different. I refer to these people as the N N N community, uh, the triple N community. I will say what it is a little later. It, it's an abstract community. I'm not going to explain it. Uh, the argument there is that uh, if you fix it, when do we get the difference between the regions? Only when we had fixed P1 and P2. You say, but that's uh, restrictive. You really have to take the envelope, the unit overall values of P1 and P2. But if you buy that philosophical argument, I would like to pose the question, well, what is the capacity of the additive white Gaussian noise point, point channel? Well, you could say, we all know it's this. Well, the triple N community should say, no, it is not. Because you should take the union overall values of P. Why should be restricted to a finite constraint of the transmission power? So it should be infinite. So that argument it's not a philosophical sound one, so you can say you can have very well an object that's constrained, so the sources are constrained to a certain behavior, like transmit probability that that probability, in which case we demonstrate at least one case in which these three regions satisfy this nesting. So coming back to this question of this race and the missing link, what about what, what can we say about the CP? Now in uh, this problem when this capacity was determined and when we were using the argument I outlined here, in essence we're trying to compute the CP because there is the timing information here, except it gets overwhelmed by the model that has infinite capacity within the slot and, and so it doesn't survive and it goes away and what we get is just the um, capacity with backward source. So, as stable throughput can be greater than backlog throughput, we may hope that that yet to be determined bursting capacity may be greater than the, let's say, backlog classical capacity. The triple N community comes in again with an objection. It says they cannot be different because. If you're backlogged, you can always emulate the behavior of, back, of a burst source, right? I mean, if the burst source idles because it has nothing, the fact that you're backlogged does not prevent you from also idling, which is absolutely correct observation, except that idling in the classical backlog formulation is not an option, a strategy option as to what you can do. Uh, if it is allowed, and say you can do that, well then what you're calculating is not the backlog classical capacity, you're calculating the C sub B, if you can calculate it, that's what it is. We wouldn't be complete if we didn't say uh, a few words about the famous asymptotic capacity known also as the transport capacity that started a uh, mini revolution in the network community, especially that spread outside of the two the Gupta Kumar paper of 2000, where in a model of dense wireless nodes operating under uh, strict rules, uh, it was determined that the throughput, the sum, the t tilde, and the symmetric sum, that is, under the constraint that everybody gets the same share of the resource, then it scales as the number of nodes increases, it scales as the square root which means that per source destination pair, it goes to zero asymptotically. And that was considered a definitive statement that would bury the hope that ad hoc wireless networks, large ad hoc wireless networks, as can be envisioned in many applications, would never come, come to be realized. Now, setting apart the very important practical question of what is the coefficient of this asymptotic result, because if it is large enough, uh, this doesn't mean the throughput might go down, but it's never going to 
be insignificant. But looking at the theoretical aspect, first of all, originally the uh, property was observed for uh, some throughput random, some capacity in under certain conditions that was strengthened to actually uh, get the bound from above in information theoretic terms and show the, its achievability. And therefore, yes, indeed, the sum capacity for a symmetric such system would be going to zero. But again, if the model is modified as it has been recently, and uh, the work of I. Carlos Gore and David said and that have been crucial to show that if you use cooperative, cooperative techniques uh, among the transmissions of the nodes, and if you use better detectors at the receivers, even that sample it doesn't go to zero. So it was an interesting concept, uh, a useful one uh, to stimulate people's thinking, but it wasn't anything definitive that draws the line about what we can do with it. Now I'd like to say a few words, the last component of, let's say, what more can we know? Do we only know the collision channel? No, we know something stronger than that, and that has to do with what we call with uh, Rocky, the standard multi-packet reception channel, which is a generalization of the collision and the packet erasure channel in a multi-axis setting, so in a simple setting, no relay, no multi no multiple halves. Uh, what that model is, is the following. So if you imagine a multi-axis situation, in, in fact it's a little stronger than multi-axis, you can have individual, the, the interference channel can be modeled that way. You have individual receivers and you have groups of sources that attempt to uh, reach uh, some of the, not, not multicast, but just the same or individual uh, receiver. So you may have a group of transmitters attempting to reach one receiver, another group, another receiver, and so on. So if you imagine a set of uh, wireless transmitters that are attempting transmission out of the totality of the node of the uh, N transmitters that you have, then consider a subset of them. And then uh, say, can, can I characterize the, this quantity, which says the probability that if the set A transmits, the transmitters in the set B will be successful. If you can have that for every possible subset A and B with that property, which is a lot, right? Required knowledge of these quantities. And if you impose the property, the requirement that they satisfy this uh, natural property, that as the membership in either of the two sets increases, that probability of success goes down, then that's what we call the standard uh, only pilot reception channel. So it's possible to have multiple successes in one receiver, is what this says. And uh, this difficult, uh, many quantities that you need can be uh, obtained if you have a more confined model with fading and, 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 and CDMA channel with a large number of users so that uh, you can shove a lot of this difficulty of calculation to the complexity that we were saying before, the threshold calculation which the SNR criteria. So the SNR criteria is a, not a complete and accurate one, but it's a pretty good one. Well, for this object, this multi packet uh, reception standard channel, uh, again with random access, assuming that we survive the probability of attempted transmission in any slot by user i, we can define the throughput vector of that um, uh, user, which is the sum of the. the this, the, this summation simply says that if I read this, this term says that only users in set A attempt transmission. And then given that, what is the probability that the user I would be successful? Well, if, if you sum over all sets B that it can belong to, and you have this quantity, you can obtain the sum, that is the component of the uh, backlogged throughput. And then the whole vector, so this is a scalar, and then you take the vector for every node, and you have a the throughput vector, how much you can transmit. The union of them over all the P's will give you the throughput region in analogy with the model we had before uh, with the collision chart. So that's the throughput. What about the capacity and the stable throughput regions? Well, the first observation is that we start from this requirement, of course, so we can have the greater capacity, but then following a path very analogous to the argument that I outlined with the collision channel, that is taking the information rate, the idleness rate, and the identity rate, and then dividing by the length of the packet and letter packet length go to infinity, 
we get an argument of fine, defining two rates that we can characterize, the inner and outer bound the throughput, and it so happens that we calculate the capacity, uh, and, and it's bounded from below and from above, but those two get squeezed as it goes to infinity to the value of the throughput. So we say, yes, even for this model, for this object, uh, the two are equal. What about the stable throughput region? Well, this is not resolved. Uh, there is a very subtle and important problem here. So if you look at the two user case, a very simple case, with the P1, P2 attempt probabilities for transmission. Okay, so we have two specific values. Now consider two other values that are slightly larger. That is, we have a P bar vector, which is greater in component wise than the P bar. What happens? Now both users become more aggressive in trying to access the channel when they have something to transmit. Two scenarios can occur. Either that aggressiveness pays off or it backfires. Either by being aggressive, you get more successful, or you impede the other user, the other user impedes you and you are less successful and so they both suffer. So it's not clear. Um, in fact, uh, we had to consider a condition that we call the sensitivity monotonicity property that says essentially that if it is true that when you do that, when you increase the aggressiveness in accessing the channel, what happens is that the availability of the channel to each of the two users actually decreases, that is, it doesn't pay off to do this increase. Now, availability, what do we mean? It's two things that can happen. Either the other user is not there and therefore it's more available just to you, or it happens that your probability of success increases. And of course, when that will happen, this inequality will have to be satisfied. So, uh, if that property holds, well then, which is difficult to verify or disprove, um, I'll show you the next slide, then the two are the same. Now I want to make a footnote here that once you start raising these issues, you go into another branch of uh, research that has been picking up lately, that has to do with, uh, Bruce mentioned about my involvement with the pilot conference, wireless optimization, that's what it stands for, where there is a lot of attention to wireless models, where now there are strategies and uses with different payoff criteria, they have different parameters to control, and you try to find um, equilibria or behave, the consequences of different behaviors. So they can be mutations, they can be and so on. So there's been a lot of work that's picking up, and I strongly urge you to consider attending the next white office, which, by the way, may be planned for to be held next May in the United States, based on somewhere in the All right, so as I said before, in Ali for monotonicity, since new monotonicity property holds, they, all the three are the same. If not, then it would be possible to have a situation. And for fixed P, as we showed for the collision channel, it is also possible to have the stable throughput exceeding the main throughput, uh, the backward throughput, uh, for reasons that are not the same as the timing information, but because of the sharing of the resource. Sometimes you are there demanding your share, sometimes you are not under the stability constraint under the backlog constraint, you're always there and you want to try to get the most of it. So what about then the CB? Um, we don't know. We have also other instances where um, we display stable throughput region exceeding the backlog throughput region. So again, uh, we're in search of that missing link. And I summarize here the two reasons for which this would be greater, and that's why perhaps uh, motivated me to think of the title as the audacity of throughput, because with the throughput model, we have found cases where with burstiness, you gain. So maybe that would be true also if we have evidence in these with the capacities as well. Um, a very brief comment about cooperation. Cooperation is on the agenda today. So many sessions on cooperative communications took a different approach, information theoretic approach. There is also another way to view cooperation from a completely networking uh, perspective, which has nothing to do with diversity and uh, utilizing multiple paths and cooperating and designing codes and so on. It has simply to do with the following property of service systems. If you view a multi action channel as a service system, so there's a channel to be shared and these users are all distributed can coordinate their actions, 
So they cannot find the best possible thing that could be done to maximize the sum through, which would be, if you had a genie and observed who arrives at which user at what time, they put them in a single conceptual queue, and therefore you start serving them one after another, and that's the most you could get. Well, if you look at the relay from that perspective, you have the capability to implement the lack of this uh, enforcement by a superpower, you have it and partially enforced by the relay. If you assign a relay to do the following, transmit to the destination packets that it hears from the original sources that fail to make it to the destination. So that property alone introduces a different direction of cooperative techniques in which, again, we can see interesting cases where the stable throughput is high, larger than the, the uh, backlog. Uh, this is the last comment that will come on assessment of the, the status of consummation on the farm market. What has proved that just a note that nobody has asked me the question of whether it's better to have one packet which three transmitters or three different packets for each one, one receiver each. Uh, it makes a big difference from the application point of view and it has uh, implications when you are considering uh, energy savings. So if you're, 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 your objective is to maximize throughput, do you want to maximize delivered packets or transmitted packets? And what is success uh, of a transmitted packet in a multicast setting? So these are just thoughts, orthogonal a little bit to the main action of the talk, just to uh, bring in issues that are not in the normal realm of thinking that's traditionally prevailing in, in our community here. So, time has come to reveal what the triple M community is. Okay. So, many of you, of course, I'm sure, don't remember or don't know what Spiro Atom was. How many? Spiro Agnew was a vice president of the United States that had the distinction that he narrowly avoided going to jail. <laughs> he used the term, 19 numbers of negativism, to refer to a group that was promoting views unpleasant to his ears. Uh, at that time, in the 70s, he was the vice president of Nixon. The, it was the time of the Cultural Revolution or post-Cultural Revolution in China and there was a very popular book, The Thought of Mao Zedong, that was circulated widely in the United States and uh, somebody published The Thought of Spiro Agnew. It was a little red book that had all the empty pages inside. <laughs> Except one statement in the flip, when we opened the book and it said, when the sun is setting, short people cast long shadows. <laughs> but notice that thought, if you add an R and you put a P and a U, it becomes throughput. So maybe that was the case of zero throughput. All right, so the status of consummation. Well, this is a nice poster of the marriage of figure that shows that the two entities still are looking apart, but they pretend they're looking apart. Maybe they want, it's hard to tell what's happening here. And I will summarize in closing uh, now some. Uh, I think the guise of lightness uh, should not hide the seriousness underneath. So, information theory community continues resisting deviation from some orthodoxy. That is a fact. That can be interpreted as, as far as the consummation is concerned, as rigidity. <laughs> At the same time, it does have the tools. So that can be interpreted as fertility. The network community, often it is true, slips on rigor. It will take fixed probabilities and let the uh, end go to infinity and keep that probability be the same for success. Or it will use the SNR criterion Theory is not valid. Uh, sometimes information theory also does similar things. It says that I'm using the Shannon formula that requires uh, symptotic length and I'm having a finite packet length. But anyway, 
the Latin community is more often guilty of slipping on rigor, which suggests maybe the possibility of impotence. But it is quick to explore new ideas and challenges. Well, I must admit, I mean, networking people come up with crazy ideas and they pursue them, they push them, they shop them, and then sometimes they go nowhere, sometimes they do, which is the task. So, the doctor <laughs> hears the two sides and wants to come up with a suggestion. So, you need a stimulus package, don't take that. <laughs> Information theory trained the networking community in two usage. Again, keep it. <laughs> example, the SINR, that's not an example, but you can have other. And do not be dismissive of non orthodox views. To networking, the doctor says, learn to use the tools properly. That requires a learning curve. That is the, the difficulty. A lot of very bright theory scientists and other people from the network community, they just have to pay a heavy price in understanding communication and information theory to go over the learning curve. If they do that, it will be a different landscape. And of course, at the same time, be careful of what is being claimed. So, we come to opera now, because I'm not going to sing very the, the, I believe that. There is, every situation can be modeled in the context of some operatic situation. And so this relationship between information theory with as a female and networking with as a male, of course, we have plenty of net, um, uh, metaphors in, in opera. One is the overbearing case. So I, I, even, I don't even think of asking how many know the story of Tosca. You know, but there is this opera, Tosca, that has this heroine who is extremely fond and loving of her lover, Mario Gavaldosi, and she's overbearing, though, know, and uh, eventually she leads to his and her destruction. So, one well, possibility is that you're very, very uh, encouraging of, of networking and investigation, but you are overbearing by, by saying, okay, this is not orthodox, or this is crazy. Or the other is the dismissive case. Okay, that's the theory of Carmen. Maybe more people are familiar with that. So the dismissive case, Carmen says to her ardent lover, I don't want to see you anymore. You're not worth anything. Guess what happens at the end? He kills, he kills her, of course. He gets damaged as well. So the lesson is that if you are overbearing or dismissive, networking pays the price for sure. But information theory does not survive so I want to avoid that. Uh, with that, I will thank you very much. Through 
really important uh, core and, and not be bogged down by details. But you cannot ignore the principles that they needed to handle the order. Okay, thank you, Tony.